Uh, thank you, President Hensley. That was quite an introduction. And first off, I'd like to recognize your recent announcement. After more than 15 years, your leadership, fundraising, and decision-making have made Stanford what it is today. You made it successful, and most of all, you made Stanford the place where every student in America and beyond wants to come. This school and all of us owe you an enormous debt of gratitude. Thank you, President Hennessy. And to you, the graduating class of 2015, what an entrance. This weekend is the first time I've been back on campus since I graduated. And if you have to come back to visit, this is the way to do it. It's a beautiful day, the sun is out, and today is a celebration. It's a celebration for all of you. Savor this moment, take it in, put it in your pockets, and if you're ever having a bad day, take it out again. You have ahead of you the most exciting part of your lives. You're about to leave this place and take a leap into the unknown, and that is the most fun thing to do in life. You're about to start an adventure. Don't be afraid. Take the leap. Take it every time. When I left here, I took a leap and I moved to Cairo. I left just a few weeks after my graduation. I had no job lined up, no contacts. I spoke no Arabic, and I had about $2,000 in my pocket. I packed two suitcases, and I left on a one-way ticket. I wanted to be a journalist, and I thought the Middle East would become the story of my generation. The Cold War was over. The US was the only superpower left standing. And in this new dynamic, I figured the old cultural and religious conflicts of the Middle East would once again bubble up to the surface. It was a gamble, but why not gamble? This is the time in your lives to gamble. You are all here today because of years of hard work and discipline. Stanford isn't really a place for slackers. That, of course, would be Berkeley. But let me say, hard work is overrated. Breaking rocks is hard work too. So is a Stairmaster, but it doesn't get you anywhere. This is the time to make a big bet and see if it pays off. An inspired guess can be far more valuable than years of toil. When I arrived in Cairo, it was dirty and crowded and just filthy but I love the unknown of it all. I love that I was trying to figure it out on my own. I rented a very cheap apartment. It cost me about $100 a month, and you get what you pay for. It barely had any water. Some of the windows didn't have any glass in them, and the roaches were big and fearless. One of them actually made eye contact with me, which I'd never seen before. And when I approached this roach, it did not back away. But there was nonetheless this wonderful feeling of community. I remember the first time I pulled up to a traffic light in a taxi. It was hot and the driver was eating an ice cream, and there was a police officer on the corner. And the taxi driver, without hesitation, reached out of his window, handed this police officer his ice cream cone, and the policeman took a big lick and handed it back. <laughs> and we drove off and I thought, well, that's something you wouldn't see in New York. And it all seemed so new and so different. I tried to make contacts to ingratiate myself into the community. I invited a man over to my apartment for dinner. He was a local journalist and he didn't have any money, but he knew a lot of key political players. And he brought along his son, who must have been about seven or eight years old. And I wanted to make a good impression, so I went to the best market in Cairo and I bought these expensive ravioli and I spent all day cooking and making sauce and chopping tomatoes, and I served these ravioli, making a big show of it. And this boy immediately started crying and whining. He was telling his father he wanted meat. He thought he was going out for dinner with a foreigner, no less, and that there would be meat. And his father became very embarrassed, and he elbows him, and he says, just eat your potatoes, and there'll be meat at home. 
and it sort of continued like that. Uh, within a short time of my arrival, I was being st uh, followed by the local police. Uh, thankfully, the intelligence agents were pretty easy to spot. One actually wore sunglasses and a black leather trench coat in the middle of the summer. And he would sort of follow me, darting around buildings. It was, it was kind of comic. And the intelligence services would bug my phone. And I could actually hear them coughing in the background. Uh, surveillance was pretty low tech then. And I tried to talk to the people who were listening on the line, you know, Ahmed, is that, is that you? Uh, but they would always hang up. I, I didn't let it bother me. Sometimes you just have to roll with it and put yourselves in situations where you don't know what's going on and let your brain sort it out. It will. And that's the fun part, the constant learning, the new sensations, the new places, and the new risks. And this is what all of you have to look forward to after today. Classes are over. Now is the time to travel, to explore, to take chances, to fall in love easily and often, to seek out all that is beautiful, inspiring, and romantic. Now is the time to do that one thing you really want to do. Be careful, of course, don't be naive. But if you don't take risks and go beyond your comfort zone, you won't continue to expand your minds. My adventure, my risk, began after graduation, and it was to go to the Middle East and try and build a life there. I chose the Middle East because I thought it would be the place where I could ride the train of history. I wanted to be a journalist because I thought it would allow me to sit in the front car of that train, standing shoulder to shoulder with the conductor, taking pictures and asking questions, poking around the engine rooms, instead of just standing on the tracks and watching the train pass me by. For most of the past 20 years, I've been riding that train through difficult patches. Mainly, I've been reporting on wars. I don't do it because I like wars. In fact, I hate them. With each one I cover, I hate them more. I hate the suffering, I hate the violence, but I go to war because it's revealing. Like scientists smash atoms together to understand their components and maybe understand the universe, war exposes everything. If you want to understand war, Think of a car crash. Imagine a bus slamming into a car at an intersection. It's not a pleasant thought, and I'm sorry to put it in your heads today of all days, but hang with me for a second. In that terrible moment, you can see the entire range of the human experience. Maybe someone's dead. Maybe someone else is injured. Maybe an ambulance is coming. If not, why not? Maybe you see someone in the street rushing in to help. Perhaps someone else is rushing away, pushing someone down as he escapes. It's all right there. The horror, the heroism, the twisted machines, the courage and the cowardice, lives changing, intersecting, and ending, all in a single climactic moment. Now, imagine two nation states, or just as likely these days, two ethnic or religious groups smashing into each other. That's war. Everything is laid bare. I go to war zones not because I like the violence, but I hope by watching the crucible and fearing it, maybe we can understand our humanity a little better and perhaps even improve our societies. Watching wars hasn't always been easy. I've been accused of being a spy. I've been deported, arrested, and kidnapped. I've been shot at a lot. <laughs> And I've seen the rise of terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. The train of history has been bumpy as it's rumbled through the Middle East. It still is. And yet, even after all of this, I still cannot find consistently the secret safe way. I saw it once, and then it disappeared like a mirage. For the parents out there, the secret Safeway is a supermarket, which because of an odd configuration of exits and roads is difficult to find. A group of students went there a week ago and have not been heard from since. Their diplomas will be sent in the mail. My biggest gamble of all, really, was in Iraq. 
It was back in 2002. The Iraq War was about to begin. I knew it was going to be a transformative event, but I couldn't get into Baghdad. Saddam Hussein's regime was only giving out a few visas to reporters, and I couldn't get one. The regime was giving out visas for human shields, people, preferably Americans, who were willing to go to Iraq, and I kid you not, volunteer to be human shields for Saddam Hussein's regime. I thought, I'll get one of those. The idea was for us, the shields, to chain ourselves to Saddam's oil facilities or airports to make it more difficult for the US military to bomb. I had no intention of being a human shield, but it was the only way I could see to get into Baghdad. So I took $20,000 in cash, strapped it to my ankle, went to Baghdad, and began my short career as a human shield. It was very short. I immediately went into hiding. I didn't show up for my human shield responsibilities. Instead, I waited for the war begin, secretly moving from hotel room to hotel room. I was waiting for the train of history to rumble through Baghdad. And boy, did it ever. It hasn't stopped. Now, all of you have to decide what your adventure is going to be. You have to figure out where the train of history is heading next and where you can get on it. And if you can do that, if you can guess the train's next station, I guarantee you will be successful. The journalists here will know where to go. The entrepreneurs will know where to invest. The artists will know what to comment on. The scientists will know what to invent. So truly, today, or maybe once you sober up tomorrow, go somewhere quiet, take a few aspirin, and think about these big questions. And then when you've decided where the train is heading, get moving and get on board. I have a few suggestions you might want to consider. I believe three things will shape your times. Massive urbanization, climate pressure, and communications technology. They are already coming together to make a very explosive cocktail. Take Cairo again. There are now about 18 million people living in Cairo. It's poor, the infrastructure is crumbling, and now with smartphones, everyone can communicate and commiserate. What happens when Cairo grows to 25 or 30 million, and the air is even more polluted, and communications are even more advanced? Will it be more or less stable? I think it will be far more volatile and the same can be said of dozens of other big cities. I suspect there will be a growing tendency for fast revolutions with short fuses and for strong men to emerge, promising stability in exchange for their citizens' rights. It's a Faustian bargain. Beware of it. You are in for a rough road. But in the end, that's part of the excitement too. The unknown awaits, and you are in the best position of anyone in the world to experience it. You are about to receive a fantastic degree. You have youth in abundance, and there's nothing else in the world worth having. You have smarts, so don't squander it all, chasing the mundane allures of money and comfort. Please, please don't go get desk jobs. Try something new, then try it again. And finally, never forget to be amazed. I was in Libya a few years ago covering the fall of Muammar Gaddafi, who may have been the strangest person I've ever met. I was in Tripoli broadcasting the news, but what viewers at home didn't see was that as the city was falling to US-backed rebels, I slipped away with my team for a little break. We escaped the mayhem of the war to visit the ancient city of Subratha, which is right on the Mediterranean coast. There was no one else there, not even a guard. It was silent, except for the splashing of the Mediterranean. We let ourselves into the archeological park, and it was this abandoned city, and we wandered around. We wandered around these ruins to gods long since forgotten, and some of them were actually submerged underwater. We, swipped, we stripped down to our underwear, climbed on top of the column bases, and dove right off of the ruins into the sea. 
It did wonders for us. I felt completely rejuvenated. It was as if the water was some fountain of life. The war in Libya no longer seemed to be about Gaddafi or NATO or the bombs. I felt connected to the ancient land. I felt connected to history. I felt like my gamble to see the world up close and to try to understand it as best I could had finally paid off. After the swim, we went back to work. Our bosses hadn't missed us. We got away with it. We stole a drink of inspiration from the middle of a war. Always look for opportunities for inspiration. Never miss a chance to see something new or to live your lives all the way up. You have eyes to see, legs to move you, and hands to grab. So use them to grab life by the neck. Technology is wonderful and powerful and efficient, but there's no app for inspiration. Don't let a four-inch screen narrow your vision. Open your eyes wide enough to let the entire world come in. Thank you, class of 2015, for letting me talk to you for a few minutes. You have so much to look forward to. Your adventures are about to begin. And don't forget to thank your parents today. This is a very special day for them as well. Thank you, and congratulations.